a focus on the social determinants of health is not just about understanding health and the causes of health, but the causes of the causes of health. And, and I think a focus on the social determinants really is a key to the prevention of mental illness. I, I, I think we're, we're, we're talking about um, addressing the problems before they emerge. What are the circumstances that we can address? So those transitioning from full-time ADF service are uh, at particular risk for mental disorders. Um, so almost three in four meet the criteria for a lifetime mental disorder compared to less than half in the general Australian population. And almost half met the criteria for a mental disorder in the past year compared to about 20% in the Australian adult population. Um, this is a particular risk for those discharged medically. Um, and as well as the disordered level, um, there's also a substantial number who have sub-threshold symptoms, which are both a barrier to uh, participation, um, a cause of significant disability, but also a precursor of later development of a disorder itself. Um, the important issue to note, and, and this is the case when you look at the Australian population as well, is many of those who meet the criteria for a 12-month disorder aren't where you expect that they would be. So many of those in the veteran population are those who weren't, not, not those who were uh, discharged for medical reasons um, or are not DVA clients. So, so there's a, a large proportion of veterans with mental health problems who are not necessarily on the radar. Um, and in terms of the time frame, the, the, the increase of being identified with a mental disorder as, as the Transition Wellbeing Research Program found is from one year post-discharge. Um, and, and this is very similar in terms of the retirement literature as well. There, there's a period around retirement transitions where there's, there's very positive mental health amongst the general population, and then the evidence of, of the distress, the mismatch, the, the lack of, of expectations being met, the, 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 uh, the, the lack of continuity of those connections that are so important begins to emerge after a year or so. So, so again, there are, there are parallels between this population and other populations where, where research around mental health has been conducted. And so to illustrate this, let's, let's turn to some of the, the data from the Path Through Life study. So, so here what we're looking at is the likelihood that individuals have depression from uh, a well-established measure of depression, the PHQ, and we're going to look at the likelihood of depression as a function of your, the, the income of the household in which you live. And what we see on, on the left-hand side, so, so those people within Canberra. So, so you can argue that Canberra is a fairly, a, a fairly advantaged community, but, but there are people who are in um, poor and adverse circumstances in, in Canberra as well. And if you have a look, those who are in the, the, the poorest households have a one in three chance of being identified with depression. One in three, as opposed to those in the wealthiest households who have a chance of one in 20 a likelihood of one in 20 of being identified with depression at the time that we conducted this survey. And the critical issue is, is this gradient. So, so you can see that as household income increases, the likelihood that you as an individual, your family members have depression decreases. So, so there, there, isn't, there isn't just a, a cut point, and if you get that income, then you're fine. There, there's a gradient. So, so this suggests that a focus on addressing the social determinants of health, of promoting mental health, physical health as well, doesn't necessarily just mean focus on, focusing on those who are most disadvantaged. Of course, from an equity perspective, that's important to do, um, particularly when we're talking about severe disadvantage. But addressing socioeconomic circumstances, broader circumstances right across the spectrum is going to increase the health and well-being of the entire population. So I think we, we all recognise, and the literature certainly tells us, that work has a range of benefits for mental health. Um, first and foremost, th th there are the manifest benefits. You get paid. Um, you have an income, which means that you can participate in society because you have those resources and the rewards that, that come from being in work. But work also brings a range of latent benefits. It brings a sense of purpose and identity. It, it provides a way to structure one's day, um, getting up, travelling to work, the sorts of routine of the, the work day benefit individuals. There's the social connections that come through work as well. Um, 
And I think these latent benefits may be particularly important in a veteran context where you're looking at the sorts of jobs that people have come from and the purpose, the identity, the contribution that people have made through the previous work and how important is it going to be that there's, there's some continuity, some, some maintenance of that sense of identity and purpose that comes through work. So, so this is some, some data from the HILDA survey. Um, so we're looking at the, the SF36 mental health index as the score here of mental health. On this scale, higher scores represent better mental health. And, and so this graph is basically replicating the findings um, that I showed you earlier from the national survey. So, so optimal jobs, so people who are working, um, on average, they've got a score of around 77 on the mental health index, whereas those who are unemployed have a score of around 72. Um, so, so that's about a five point difference. So a difference of about three or four points on this scale is deemed clinically significant. Um, so, so again, we're demonstrating that those people who are in work have better mental health than those people who are unemployed. But now we've got this continuum of job quality. So, so what do you think we find when we, look at, when we look at job quality as well? So what we see is, again, that gradient. Um, so compared to those who are in the optimal jobs, those people who report one poor aspect of work have poorer mental health. Those who report two have poorer mental health again. And those who are in the poorest job, which in this case represents three or four of those characteristics we mentioned earlier, so that's unmanageable demands, no control over how you go about doing your work, insecurity in work, and a sense that, that your pay isn't fair, um, report poorer mental health, much poorer mental health. And the interesting thing is the mental health of those in the poorest quality jobs is actually worse than those who are unemployed. So what we should be looking at is sustainable employment, employment that, that nurtures the individual as a way of promoting positive mental health. 